Chapter 1. Kidnapped by Jack Sparrow Over my shoulder, a hazy tropical sun hung low in the western sky. The sailing dory glided easily across the water in much the same way the motorboat had been doing moments earlier. I sailed alone. Within minutes, I'd tacked into the harbor and tied off to a rickety dock. I dropped the sail and secured it as best I could with a coarse rope, looped a line around a snapped-off piling, and stepped ashore. Horse-drawn wagons and ox carts competed for space with pedestrians on the narrow, rutted road along the waterfront. In an open-air market, vendors sold raw fish, lobster, and conch, overripe bananas, and squishy pineapples. The place had the unwelcome smell of a trash dumpster. You may be wondering why I didn't stay with the dory. The thought never occurred to me. It was like when you're dreaming. You don't really know you're dreaming. You think what you're seeing is really happening, and sometimes, if it's a bad dream, it scares you. Like in a dream, you could be walking down a dark and narrow street on a tropical island with dangerous-looking men eyeing you suspiciously from the doorway of a drinking establishment, and all of a sudden go, Wait, what? Is that Jack Sparrow calling to me? That's what happened. Jack Sparrow beckoned me into a grog shop. Except it wasn't the real Jack Sparrow. Obviously. Disney would never allow the real Jack Sparrow to appear in my story. Psst, Jacob, Jack Sparrow said to me. Jack Sparrow stood in the doorway of a grog shop called, what else, the grog shop. Behind him stood other swarthy-looking sailors, all wearing cutlasses on hips and rings and lips and knives on belts. Cerveza? Jack Sparrow held up an amber bottle. Ron? Jack Sparrow spoke Spanish. Who knew? I was not about to go into a bar with Jack Sparrow. Mom would find out. Mom always found out. Even if it was like 300 years before I was born, Mom would still know. From the opposite side of the street, another swarthy-looking person called to me. You'll be wanting to think twice about going in thar, mate. I'm not sure why pirates talk the way they do in movies and this story, but sometimes I think I need a translator. I looked in the direction of the other man's voice. Directly opposite the grog shop was a dilapidated home turned into a drinking place called Willie's Knee. Standing in the doorway was a tall, broad-shouldered man with a bushy mustache and beard. He wore long pants and black boots. Es rente, chico, Jack Sparrow replied to the man in black boots. Urgent, says you, said Black Boots. What do you know about urgent? Sea urchins, now they be something you know a thing or two about. Apparently, I had stumbled into the middle of a bar war between competing drinking establishments. Smelly men from both drinking places rushed into the street and pressed in around me so close I couldn't move. It was like being at a baseball game when the bench is clear. I was the poor fool trapped on the pitcher's mound, unable to escape. One shoved me in the back. Another ruffled my hair playfully. I tried to push my way through, but the men closed ranks. Some laughed. Others called me, Boy! Niñita! Lady Godiva! I still carried Mom's handbag with the ledger inside. But then, a knife pressed against my ribs. That definitely got my attention. Jack Sparrow whispered in my ear, Run, guppy! and I'll gut you like a grouper. Savvy? Still pressing the tip of his knife against my ribs, Jack Sparrow shoved me into an even darker and narrower alley. That's when things got really bad.